Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting, comedy and yarn in equally large measures. I'm your host, Joe Milmine, and coming up in today's show, we have a rundown of all the latest things I've been knitting, we have a local yarn shop review, and we also talk to Sally Cameron, also known as Pink Hair Girl, about all things yarny and business. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 26 of the podcast, Writing a Knitting Book with Sally Cameron. I should have probably called this Writing a Knitting Book While Homeschooling Three Children, Um, but it's quite a long title. And uh, today is Sunday the 30th of November. Welcome back to the show if you're a returning listener and if you're a new listener, welcome in. I hope you'll enjoy what you find here. We do like to have a little bit of a laugh and... um, talk a little bit about knitting as well. So as I mentioned today is St Andrew's Day. It is Scotland's official national day. St Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland and seeing as we are technically a Scottish podcast, although I'm not Scottish, I don't sound Scottish, I am half Scottish. Um, A very happy St Andrew's Day to all those of you who are celebrating. There'll probably be, probably be a few parties around here, maybe some Kaylee dancing, a uh, few beers and things um, going on today, but unfortunately I'll be otherwise engaged, practising my little socks off at uh, the pantomime practice this afternoon. It's all starting to get a little bit serious, it opens in two weeks, and uh, it's all well and good practising with a lot of adults, but when you bring a lot of kids into the mix as well, particularly when you sort of pay them in Haribo and Swizzle lollies, um, it can get a little bit crazy to say the least they do get a little bit excited Uh, so we need plenty of practice with them and Sunday is a good time to kind of get that in because if you try and make them practice when uh, they've been to school all day they're they're just not very good because they're tired and um, it becomes a little bit counterproductive then so uh, Panto practice has gone earlier gone to three o'clock now to be honest, I think if we started at nine o'clock, we'd still be woeful, but hey, you know, um, so that should be quite good. So once I've uh, recorded the podcast, I will be going to uh, alter some more costumes. I have a, a wedding dress that I need to put some, I'll draft a pattern for sleeves and then put the sleeves into, as well as swapping my tail over with King Rat's tail, because apparently King Rat's tail is too cat-like and mine was too rat-like, so... We'll be swapping those over, so I'll probably get that done today, but the, the sleeves won't be in, in time for uh, today's practice, unfortunately. But it's been a very busy week, so uh, yeah, it's just going to have to wait, unfortunately, because uh, we've only got one piece of fabric to do it with, so I don't really want to do it wrong. Um, Thank you to everyone who got in touch over the past week or so, particularly those of you um who joined in a bit of chatter on Monday, I think it was, uh, regarding... The last episode where we discussed uh, socks for need uh, socks for needles needles for socks needles for socks and what kinds of um, needles you can use to do the different uh, techniques for knitting socks, in particularly in particular those who got in touch to discuss uh, the use of the little miniature circulars, the little nine inch circulars that Claire talked about. She wasn't particularly keen on. Um, a few people got in touch on Twitter and we'll uh, we'll read all of those out next time when Claire is back on the show with Kate um, and see what the general consensus is. There have been a couple of really good comments in the thread for that episode, so if you've got anything to add, um, either tweet it across or make a comment on the show notes or in the Ravelry group. Uh, if you've used these needles, if you're curious about these needles, if you've got any questions about these needles, um, then get in touch and we'll try and include that in the show. We were also very kindly offered a set of asymmetric circulars to try uh, by Rachel of Tangled Yarn, which is tangled-yarn.co.uk from memory, but I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, So we're expecting those to turn up soon and we'll probably try those over Christmas so we can give them a really good try and give you some good feedback on how we find those when we're knitting, uh, Claire's going to have a set and I'm going to have a set as well. So um, that's something that will be coming up in the future. But if you've got anything to add regarding DPNs, uh, long circulars or the little teeny circulars in the meantime, please do uh, pop over there because we will read them out on the next episode. So you'll be famous. <laughs> what else has been going on? 
In Woolly News, I recently blogged for Wovember. You probably saw it uh, last week. I added it to the um, Facebook page and on Ravelry, etc. and tweeted it up a little bit. And Wovember is, is basically a month of celebrating everything woolly. It was originally started by Kate Davies, Tom of Holland and uh, Felicity Ford, who is Knit Sonic. He's just brought out a fab... Um, colour work book and this year um, as you know or you will know Kate Davies um, has just brought out a book Yokes which we will be reviewing when my copy turns up very soon from Fluff and uh, I think Tom of Holland also has a book out so this year um, Felicity teamed up with Louise Scully friend of the podcast and hostess of the Knit British podcast which if you don't listen to I'm sure you do if you listen to me but if you don't hop on over to her and give her a listen. She's got a lovely Scottish accent. And she's been blogging along with Felicity and a host of other guest bloggers as well have contributed uh, to the post for this celebration of wool, really, and I was one of them. I wrote an article, somewhat unsurprisingly, given my uh, taste in yarn, on um, alternatives to Merino and BFL. Uh, in hand dyed sock yarns because they're definitely becoming a lot more popular in kind of machine, not machine, factory, mill dyed blends and certainly getting things that are a little bit more interesting coming through on the commercial side and I just wanted to highlight the hand dyers that are working with uh, breeds other than BFL and Merino essentially. So there were six in there, pop over and have a look, there's some famous ones, there are some new ones and uh, hopefully it'll give you a few ideas about what those particular breed yarns will be suitable for and maybe encourage you to give some of them a try. I've also been busy working up my new office, I'm podcasting this afternoon from my new office so you may find the sound levels are a little bit different. I'm playing around with different setups because I've got a very sensitive microphone and everywhere I sit in the house seems to give a little bit of an echo. It's not that the house is all wooden floors or anything like that. And the walls are certainly not wooden, they're more like ply. <laughs> ply board on possibly marshmallow in all honesty. Um, but there does seem to be a little bit of an echo and I'm playing around with finding an area where at least that will always be the same uh, when podcasting. So we went shopping for a new desk because I need a, a obviously because I'm a freelancer, I need a, an area to work where that's for working and the rest of the house doesn't get taken over by work related things and so I can effectively go to work, which was previously the dining room table and I was quite good at only working at the dining room table. Um, but obviously when the children are home and I still have work to do, it's quite tricky because they just run in and out and climb on you and, and everything else. So... In the spare room, I've set up a little office. I'm very excited about that and managed to source an old um, leather-topped ladies' writing desk from a local kind of second-hand shop. In, uh, it's in an old church in Elgin um, on South Street, if you're familiar. Uh, it's called Sign of the Times. It's definitely not a sign of the times. Um, but they've got some interesting stuff in there and um, I picked up this uh, leather-topped desk i don't think it is genuine kind of of the period type thing it's more of a reproduction but it looks the part and it's the right size it's a little bit smaller than an ordinary desk it's a ladies desk we only write letters when we're ladies we don't do any work obviously and um we've popped the imac up on there so that um Mealy can do his work on his imac and i can move my laptop up and down wherever and we've put millie's bank lamp up on there as well which is one of those brass um armed lamps with the green shades that you normally see in banks or that, the traditional thing of banks so that's in there as well i put a picture on instagram uh last week so i was very excited about it i'll i'll put that in the show notes so you can have a look if you're interested and i'm looking forward to kind of i have my yarn cupboard in this room as well where i store all my yarn and i'm looking forward to uh, getting a few more bits of art up on the wall I saw a print done by uh, Tilly Flop Designs um, at Yarndale and I really want that in a, in, in grey so I can put that up in my uh, office space as well and put some mini skeins up that I've been collecting just make it a little bit inspiring really so that was very exciting if you've got any good resources for planning your kind of knitting slash craft slash home office nook 
um, then please do give me a shout and let me know if you know of any good places to go for inspiration. Other than that, I've been extremely busy. Again, if you've seen um, on Instagram, I'm, I'm getting re really into Instagram. It's quite good fun. Uh, Twitter's a bit boring. Um, Instagram's much more fun. And uh, I've been very busy packing up the parcels for the final quarter of 2014 for the Golden Skate. Now, I'm not going to tell you, obviously, yet which yarns are in there because they've not been posted. They're going out tomorrow. But um, I really liked this one. I know I said that about all of them, but this one was a real surprise. I think um, if you've seen the photo, it's a picture of um, a harbour in Hong Kong with a load of fireworks. And the yarn that we've got, you can see how it relates to the picture, but it's nothing like you would expect. And certainly, even if you knew the names of the dyers, it's not necessarily what you would expect them to do either, which I think is really interesting. So it'll be, it'll be good to see what people think of that when uh, these shiny parcels land on their uh, doorsteps in a few days. So I'll probably take a few more comedy pictures later, because when you've got a massive bag of gold parcels, that's the only thing that you can do, quite frankly. And... Um, and they'll all be going out to the post office uh, tomorrow. There are still places if you want to get involved. And we also released um, next year's clubs as well. And the details for that are all on www.thegoldenskin.com. So if you want to go check it out and uh, be in our club, then you're more than welcome. Obviously, as I always say, if even if you're not a subscriber, you're more than welcome to come over to the Group on Ravelry and meet meet the gang, have a bit of a laugh with us, uh, see if you can get some ideas and find some new dyers. You can go and pick your own yarns from, their from those dyers. The whole point is just to have a bit of fun with a hand dyed, really, and uh, expand your horizons a little bit. So everyone's welcome. Come over and see us. And the Group on Ravelry is the Golden Skate. So I think, seeing as we've not really talked about it much uh, recently, we'll uh, pop on to the Whipping Piccadilly section. So what have I been knitting then? Apologies if you can hear any um, thudding around in the background. The family is in. They're cooking a roast dinner downstairs and uh, as I've mentioned before, the walls, the floor, the whole house is pretty uh, thin in the wall department. They could do with a lot more uh, soundproofing, if you ask me. But there you go. It is the triumphant return of the Whipping Piccadilly section, or not so triumphant, depending on how much you expect me to have trotted out in the finished object department between uh, the last time I told you what I was knitting and now. But there you go. And um, I've done all right, actually. I think changing it up a little bit and starting to knit with super chunky yarn and um, knitting smaller things uh, certainly always is going to increase your output and concentrate on, on one thing rather than 15 again generally adds productivity in the knitting department so the first thing that I have started and finished is the Lapsang hat by our very own Claire Devine and this is a pattern for a kind of textured hat with a pom-pom. Mine has a pom-pom. It's a very small pom-pom. I've invested in some bigger pom-pom makers from Ginger Twist Studios. And um, the pom-pom maker I was using for this pattern was a pony one. And it just didn't really work for the... It's a chunky yarn that I've knitted it in. And although it did make a pom-pom, it wasn't really... The colossal pom-pom it could and probably should have been but I didn't have the other pom-pom makers and nobody in town stocked the pom-pom makers so I had to make do with the pony one because I wanted to wear it in fact I've worn it loads now but I'm going to bother blocking it <laughs> I've still not photographed it I've not added it on Ravelry it was that quick of a knit and um as I said it's a pattern for a a, a chunky hat with a ribbed brim and the pattern it's reversible actually on the inside it's quite structural and geometric and then it's a lot more flowing on the outside but you can wear it either way around uh, the sizing comes with um, a more fitted version and then there's a slouchy version I went for the slouchy version 
as uh, I wanted to use as much of the yarn as possible. The yarn I knit this in was Eden Cottage uh, Maya Chunky, which is 100% baby alpaca. And it's in a colourway Ash, which is a lovely grey shade. So it's, a bit, it's all a bit clear divine, really, to be honest. And uh, it, the yarn is so soft. When the skin arrived, I actually just wanted to put googly eyes on it and give it a name and keep it as a pet because it was just so lovely. So it was hard to uh, break it out and, and use it for something, but I'm glad I did because I've, I've not really had the hat off. In all honesty, it suddenly got a bit cold up here and uh, any excuse, it's baby alpaca weather. And in fact, I've worn it around the house for a couple of days while, uh, while I've been working. I'm just like, put my hat on. Even though the heating's on, I've put my hat on because it looks cool. So um, it was very, very quick uh, to knit this hat. And even when people tell me it's a quick knit, for me, it's normally not that quick because uh, I'm knitting 15 other things at the same time. Uh, but it was it was very quick. It was probably three hours total, I reckon. Um, and I had to rip that back as well because I, I, I did a little mistake in it. So it, this would be brilliant for any gift knitting, particularly last minute stuff that you uh, need to do. You could knock one of these up in a night and um, with it being baby alpaca, it's quite luxurious. You feel like you've actually got something and it's so snuggly and warm. It's just, yeah, I can see a lot more of this baby alpaca in my life. The big mistake I made with this project is taking it down to Wigan to visit my mum. And uh, I rocked up and she said, oh, that's a nice hat. Can I have a look at that? Which means let, take it off and let me touch it. She don't want to look at it. She looks with her hands. So I did. And she's like, oh, that's lovely. Yeah, it's soft. Yeah. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, Obviously, I mentioned that, that I was going to give her my Lush cardigan and knit a smaller one. So uh, I showed her my cardigan. I was like, look, mum, my cardigan, yeah. She's like, do you want to try it on? And she, she like, touched it. And it's, it is soft. It's, like, the softest merino ever. And uh, she touched it and she went, hmm, yeah, I fancy some of that, that alpaca me. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I bet you fancy some of that alpaca you. Uh, so she doesn't want my uh, beautiful black as one merino cardigan. She wants one in baby bloody alpaca. I don't know when she thinks I've got time to knit this. Um, so I'm going to have to come up with a new plan for the Lush as well. But notwithstanding any of that, yeah, the Lapsang pattern by Claire Divine. It's available on Ravelry. I think from memory it's £3. And um, a brilliant quick little gift knit, knit reversible dead easy, looks quite fancy for minimal effort, uh, so it's a big thumbs up from me. And the next thing I had on the needles was one again that I mentioned last time, it's the Hipster Hat by Tin Can Knits. I am knitting this for Millie and it is in the Black or West Country Tweed because I wanted to knit it up into a hat and give it to somebody who was going to abuse it and see how the yarn came out. I reviewed that yarn in episode... 23 maybe 23 I think I'll link to the episode in the show notes anyway and uh, that is knitting up quite quickly as well it's a DK weight and um, unfortunately I think the pattern details weren't quite matching in Ravelry so I've had to cast on a small rather than a medium but I've tried it on his rather large and wonky head and uh, it does fit so um, hopefully that'll be fine that's taken a little bit of a back seat at the moment um, for another project but uh, it came as part of the Pacific Knits book so if you have that book it will be in there and it's just a dead simple straightforward um, stocking stitch beanie again you can't really go wrong for if you're going to be gift knitting get some slightly fancy wool rattle one of these out nice little pom pom on top Bob's your uncle so um there's a lot of nice patterns in that book, so it is worth kind of uh, plumping for the book if you're going to go for one of the patterns. I don't think you would probably bother with getting this pattern separately, but um, it's good if uh, if you've bought the book for other reasons. The last thing that I have on the needles that's actually getting any attention is uh, a brand new pattern. It only came out on Friday. I got the pattern a couple of weeks ago and I've not quite made the pro progress on it that I probably should have. And this is the Cardamom Rose um cow by Thea Coleman who is known as Baby Cocktails on Ravelry. It is a pattern for a curl and it's an iron weight curl and I'm knitting this in Eden Cottage Lang 
Langdale. I want to say Langdale. I keep saying Langfell, but it's Langdale Aaron. And the colourway I think is steel, but it hadn't been labelled yet. So, um, which is again another lovely grey colourway. I think the divine is maybe maybe rubbing off on me because every one of these projects on the needles is grey. And um, it is this is a quite a really simple lace um curl. You sort of you're doing a little chunk of four repeating patterns, then there's one fiddly you know, with the yarn overs and the knitting together row, and then you go back onto the dead simple alternating pattern rows uh, for 12, 12 alternating pattern rows, and then you finish it and cast off. Um, I'm just over halfway on that. When I get a chance to actually sit down and do it, it's quite quick, but um, because I don't actually get a chance to sit down very often, it's a bit of a problem. Um, but it's, I think it's one of those patterns that will make depending on what colour yarn you do it in, it will make it have a completely different look. Um, mine looks quite structural. I'm sorry, I can hear someone thrashing around, probably downstairs, but it is that load upstairs. Um, that's the beast. Um, yeah, as I was saying, it probably looks, it will look quite kind of urban and structural in the colourway that I've done it in. But the colourway in the pictures, it looks quite soft and feminine. Cause it's, uh, I think it's in driftwood, it's quite pinky and just looks really nice. And I think it'd be very cosy to kind of throw around your uh, neck as we get into the colder winter months. It's certainly getting quite a bit colder up here. And I think it'll be much appreciated for that. Uh, that again is available on Ravelry. I will put a link to it in the show notes. It is a paid pattern, but I can't remember off the top of my head and I failed to write this down for you. Um, terrible podcast host, um, how much that is, but I will um, I will link to it in the show notes so you can pop straight through to that. So that was Cardamom Rose by Thea Coleman. So I think it's time for another little yarn shop review. I do get around a little bit, not in that way. Uh, when it comes to checking out all things yarny, I like to go and make a trip out and try different places. And naturally the first things that I did when I moved, or even when I found out I was definitely gonna move up here is check out the local yarn offerings. There are a couple of yarn shops in Elgin itself. I'm not going to talk about those today. The one I'm going to talk about is the wool shop in Nairn, which I think goes by a few names. Nairn Wool Shop, um, Caledonian Craft Connections, uh, the Wool Shop on the Bray, and it is a yarn shop that's in the middle of Nairn on the High Street, I want to say. And Nairn is a town in between Elgin and Inverness in Scotland. So it's um, sort of halfway between Inverness and Forres, I guess. It's quite big, it's got big Sainsbury's there and stuff. And probably one of the places you will uh, pop out at if you come up to the Highlands and you're looking around. Nairn is definitely one of the kind of big places that you'll go through on any of the big roads and things. So uh, well worth knowing about. This little yarn shop if um if you're going to be around that area because there are no good ones in inverness so this is your nearest decent one i would say and sort of giving away the 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 tale there a little bit but we i went along with my friend Kay uh, to the highland wool and textile fair a few weeks ago now which was in inverness at eden court which is a kind of cinema and concert venue on the banks of uh, the River Ness near the cathedral in Inverness and we saw the lovely yarn garden there along with a few other um, yarn type people and lots of other makers of varying descriptions from all around the local area which was really interesting and we decided on the way back that we were going to get off the train in Nairn and pop down to the wool shop and check it out. The train station is on the same street as the wool shop it's probably about a 10 minute walk from the train station and you just walk straight out of the station straight down the road and just go straight on and eventually as you start going down the hill it's on your left hand side and another one of these crazy scottish shops where and they do this everywhere in scotland 
the front of the shop looks dead small. And you think, oh, it's only a little shop, this. And then you go in and it's proper like Aladdin's Cave, TARDIS, bigger on the inside type job. The only shop this doesn't happen is Ginger Twist Studio, uh, where it is as, as wee as it looks outside. <laughs> and um, this shop, in, I went in thinking, oh, it'll just be some kind of acrylic palace. And I couldn't really have been more wrong. I was really surprised at the kind of um, selection on offer, really. The shop used to be, I understand, in a different shop, and they took over this shop, which used to be a carpet shop, the lady was telling me. So they've got a big area at the front where all the wool is stocked, and they've got a big area in the back where they do workshops and knit night. I haven't made it along to knit night yet because I've been practicing for the pantomime so much that I've I can't really justify yet another night out during the week. So um, that's something I'll be probably popping along to after Christmas. And um, obviously I went in there to check out what, what sort of things they have available locally. So it was it was pretty good, actually. Um, they've got all of the standard stuff you would expect to see in an ordinary uh, local yarn shop. So you've got your Rowan, Debbie Bliss, Serdar, Arcania, Noro, Sublime, Regia, Katia, Rico. And then it moves on to your kind of slightly more unusual or less frequently seen stuff uh, like Colinette and James Rennie. And then they've got some really interesting stuff from both from small producers uh like flying fl i knew i was gonna say that wrong stop laughing flying flock flock flying flock which is a brand uh, it's an alpaca yarn that is spun at uh, new lanark mill and it's got a little sheep on the front with flying goggles on it. It's amazing. Came in a couple of colours, like natural shades. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a snigger in the no nose moment. I did take a picture. I'll put that in the show notes, um, if I remember. And uh, there were a few different local um, alpaca blends that you just don't see anywhere else because they're from local alpaca farms. There was quite a lot of local hand-dyed stuff from various makers. Also hand-spun from various local people there was a massive selection of um acrylics you can't you really cannot go wrong in there for acrylics and there were also little things that have already been made up by people that were for sale so it was it was kind of like half yarn shop half sort of a gallery really for local makers which i thought was really you know something different really interesting and um i, I found up like, like africa in a lot of ways up here the pace of life is very slow and people are quite chilled out and you don't always find out about these things um, unless you go into the local shops they're not really on the internet uh, so it was really good to go in there and see what other things have got on offer in terms of yarns in particular so there was a, a brilliant range of yarn from your very commercial up to your very very small niche and very local makers they had a massive button selection along with a big selection of um notions and tools and they had your kind of standard pony stuff they had a lot of knit pro but they also had high higher bits and pieces they had chow goo bits and pieces they had a little bit of everything which is always good because that automatically when I go in somewhere if they've got a little bit of everything I'm much more comfortable saying can you order me this from high higher or order me that from chow goo because I know they've got an account with them Whereas if they're not there, I just generally wouldn't ask. I would just know who I go to normally for my uh, for my various brands. Sorry if you heard me faltering a little bit then. Uh, Millie snuck in. I didn't see him till he was right next to me and I jumped a little bit. <laughs> um, the ladies in the shop were really friendly as well. We're in there chatting for ages. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to going in and uh, taking part in Knit Night. Because I think it'll be really cool. And also seeing what workshops that they've got on offer. See if there's anything in there that I quite fancy learning. It'd be quite good, I think. And um, that's all I've got to say, really, about Nem Wool's shop so far. I've only been in once, so I will let you know um, as new things kind of come in that are interested and worth looking at. But if you're in the area and you're into your yarn, definitely worth popping in because, mostly because of the, the selection of, of local artisan products that they've got. 
that I think you'll find interesting if, if that's, you know, the sort of thing that you like. And if you're just looking for something standard because you've run out of yarn, as if anyone goes on holiday without enough projects, but imagine you did, that would be pretty poor planning. But still, if you did, that would be the place to go to get um, something standard as well. So that is Nern Wool Shop. It is in the centre of Nern on the Bray, also known as Caledonian Craft Collections. And that's my review. So as I promised uh, last week after the last episode, I'm very pleased to welcome onto the show Sally Cameron, who's going to come and chat to us a little bit more about general business things and, and yarny things and her background really in knitting. You, If you've listened to the previous episode to this one, you'll have heard my review of her recent book, Zanzi South Africa My Needles. It was a pretty glowing review, I'm not going to lie to you, and um, I thought it'd be interesting to get uh, her perspective on turning your hobby into a business really and and how that's fitted in with her family life so I'll pass you to my other self early on in the week and I hope you'll enjoy the interview. So we've been joined today very kindly by Sally Cameron also known as Pink Hair Girl whose book I reviewed on the last episode and she's joining us from South Africa to do an interview with us today. Welcome to the show Sally. Thank you very much. Hello everybody. It's lovely to be here. It's always nice to have a South African accent on the show. Because <laughs> Claire's getting a little bit English now, so it's nice to have a proper South African accent. Welcome to the show. It's, it's brilliant to have you here, as I've already said. And we're going to be chatting a little bit today about your journey as a business lady. <laughs> and, of course, about your lovely new book that it's no secret, I think is really great. <laughs> and I love the pictures in it. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank <laughs> um, so can you tell us a little bit about you as a person and a little bit about how you came to be interested in all things Yarni? Um, I live in Cape Town and I'm a mom of three, what we affectionately call the pinklets. Um, and I'm a nurse by training, not that you'd say with the pink hair, hey. um, but I haven't done that in a long time. I homeschool my children. And I've always knitted. I mean, it's something my mom taught me when I was about six years old. So it's just always something I've been able to do. And, you know, when you homeschool and you're surrounded by children all the time and dishes and laundry and, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> all, all those interesting things that go along with having a family, knitting kind of became a refuge, you know, because you can just, it's not like sewing or things where you need to set up a whole lot of stuff. You can just have a little project in a bag stuck on the side of the sofa and you can be doing somebody's reading with them and knitting a couple of rows on a sock. Or you can, you know, when everybody's fallen into bed at night and you're exhausted, you can uh, just have a little bit of time to do something for yourself. Um, and it's so tangible. You get to take some sticks and some string, you know, in the crudest terms, and you get to make something with it. You get to make something beautiful in a sense of accomplishment. So I think that's why, especially during this time of being a mom and um, homeschooling the children and not going out to work, this became a kind of refuge for me. Um, and so I just started knitting more and more. I think that's something a lot of us can identify with, definitely. Yeah. You, you, you feel like you can prove something at the end of the day. And I made this, you know. <laughs> I have achieved something besides wiping snotty noses and reading Peter and Jane and, you know, doing the umpteenth load of laundry for the day. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I find it quite yogic as well. The re repetitive motion is quite calming. Yes. Oh. So obviously you've given us a little bit of background there about you and your life in South Africa. And... Obviously, the fact that you have been knitting for quite a while, but what was the tipping point that turned what is a hobby and a refuge into more of a kind of business and serious venture? Um, it, it was quite funny, actually. I, I don't even know who suggested it or how we got onto it, but on the South African swap group, we decided to do um, a design swap where it would be a place where you didn't have to... Um, be pressured by needing to put a big design out on Ravelry, but you would just design something and make that item and swap it with another person 
in the design group, you know. So it was kind of like a safe circle in which to start designing and ask questions and bounce ideas off each other and just see if you liked the whole designing process. And I'd never I'd never designed anything before. And I um that was I did the winter is coming shawl for that um swap. That was the first uh, thing I ever designed. And um people seemed to like it and and that was kind of that's what started it really so it wasn't really a conscious decision at all it, it all transpired from um this swap of of getting people interested or just a sort of a taster into designing in, within a safe space and I found I really really enjoyed it you know, I remember that actually, because I'm, I'm in the South African swap group and I remember um, wimping out of that particular challenge. But I think that was also one of the, the, the kind of catalysts for Claire Devine starting to design yes. more seriously. And I know there was Judy George as well, who's released a few patterns since then. Yeah. And I mean, Heidi Bears also did one for the, she hadn't, she'd done her, her teddy bear before that, but she hadn't gone also full time into designing yet either. So it was kind of a springboard for quite a few people um, who weren't sure if they would like it and weren't sure. Um, it's very scary to take the big step and to put a pattern out on Ravelry when you've never done anything like that before. So within a group where you can have the support and, and work with other people, it was, a, it, was, it was a nice supported way to start. Yeah, definitely. And for those who are not familiar with the South African knitting scene, Heidi Bears, as she's as she's known on Ravelry, is the lady that's designed all the African uh, flower, crochet flower toys, the little hippo and and all the others. There's about 15 or 20 of them now. And she used to work in in a completely different industry and has now kind of gone into this far more seriously, I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, it's it's kind of become her full time, her full time career now, um, and yeah. So that that was the humble beginnings. I I didn't really mean to be a designer. <laughs> um, I kind of fell into it. But what I am and what I've always known I am is an an ideas person. Um, we had to do one of these uh, things when I was nursing, you know, as part of a team because I worked in palliative care, a palliative care community team. And, and you had to answer all these questions and then they evaluated what kind of a person you were, what kind of the person in the team you were. Um, and I was, I scored abysmally on the completer finisher scale of things. You know, the starts the task and works consistently through it and ends the one task. I am dreadful at that. And my knitting is, is testament to that. I have a thousand whips and I need to uh, flit from here to there the whole time. But what I am is an ideas person. I love coming up with ideas and new ideas and I need to be challenged by different stuff all the time. I don't like doing the same thing over and over. And, and that works very well with designing because it's all about using something or a springboard to come up with an idea that then you can create or, or challenge yourself to make that into something that actually fits somebody and that works with yarn and that you can construct in a certain way. So it, it does actually really suit my personality and the, the ideas part of me very well. That's really interesting. Um, as a complete kind of aside here, uh, while we're talking about it um, from a business point of view, I found when I lived in South Africa that South Africans generally are very enterprising and they tend to have more than one thing going on at once and nearly all of them have a little side business of some description. Have you found that to be kind of your experience or is it just something I've just a kind of product of people I've been talking to? No I think it's true and I think um, to a large extent for a lot of people and I don't know if it's changed in the rest of the world as much as here, but South Africa's gone through a fair amount of uncertainty and ups and downs and all the rest. And there is a feeling amongst everybody that you've just kind of, kind of got to get on with it. You've got to create your own future. You've got to create your own... We don't have the most stable economy in the world, so you can't rely on uh, a, always having stable jobs and kind of going into a job and working for 60 years and retiring. I mean, I think that's changing the world over. But in South Africa, people 
sort of seem to take on the entrepreneurship of um, being responsible for themselves in a, in a different way in all sorts of levels. I mean, you see people in ladies in communities using skills of beading to create things to sell for, you know, extra money or um, lots of moms that stay at home with kids will always have some little extra thing they're doing or... Um, so I don't know if it's unique to South Africa, but there certainly is an entrepreneurial spirit or a, a kind of just get on with it and, and, and do you um, add an extra and see how it goes. There's maybe not the fear of, of it going wrong um, as much because we're just such a, we're a developing country anyway. So you can you know put a new idea out there and see what happens. No, definitely. And I think probably you're right in terms of part of it is necessity and not having that security blanket of, you know, someone will come and provide and sort it out that I think does happen in the UK a lot. But also I think British people in general are a little bit more reserved and a little bit more kind of conscious of what other people think. And that maybe makes them afraid of doing something they're perfectly capable of doing, but they're too worried about what other people think and whether it'll go wrong. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any uh, uh, social security here. So, I mean, if you lose your job, that's it. There's nothing else, you know. So you do, you can't just sit on the dole or, or, or there, there's no money coming from anywhere else. You've got to make it yourself. So people realize that we, we, if they work in an industry that's less secure or they want to supplement their income or whatever it is. Um, and I think South Africans are willing to take those risks. Um and, and we're generally known as quite a friendly country. So I think we're, we are willing to put ourselves out there a bit. I think we're willing to laugh at ourselves as well, you know. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> um, so we'll move on then from, from there to um, inspiration. And do you have perhaps a favorite quote that you can turn to or that you like that inspires you? I don't know if you've seen this, that inspirational poster picture. I think it's one of those frogs with, and it's kind of hanging on by one finger or something, you know, and it, I, I, I just remember frogs on this picture and, and something about sort of hanging in there. Um, and I think a lot of the time it's, you just got to hang in there and keep going. Um, especially in a day with three children and, um, having all these wonderful ideas and thinking about how much time they're all going to take, that can sometimes be a bit overwhelming. Um, and, I, and, and this kind of ties in with, with the question of, of, you know, what good advice you received. I think it's that, that I watch too many children's movies. You know that um, Nemo movie where Dory says, just keep swimming? Yeah. <laughs> just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. It's something like that. You just keep just keep doing it. Just keep going. And, and um, yeah, so I, I think that's kind of where, um, where I get my motivation from or ins I don't know if it's inspiration, but just um, don't just leave it at, at an idea. And there are plenty of obstacles. There always are. Everybody's life has got different uh, obstacles, you know, whether people have physical challenges or um, whether people have uh, financial challenges or time constraints or whatever it is. Everybody's got something that makes a thousand reasons why you shouldn't do something. Um, and it's just hang in there, just do it, just keep going and keep taking the next step forward. Um, and it eventually all comes together in the end. Yeah, definitely. At least if you're taking a step forward, you move in. <laughs> yes, exactly. And even if it's a tiny step, it doesn't matter. Just keep, just keep trying to go, um, just keep trying to go forward. Yeah. And hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, um, we're talking about journeys and moving forward a little bit, but no journey is ever a smooth one and running a business has its ups and downs. Can you tell us about a time when things maybe didn't quite go to plan? What happened and what did you learn as a result of it? I think what didn't go to plan was my time scales and expectations of um, how, especially with the book, how it, how it would go. Um, you have these ideas and then 
you, you have to sort of put down on paper some sort of a time scale and then this is going to happen and then this is going to happen. Um, and when you're doing this in between three children and homeschooling and, and all the rest, um, it just never happened like that. I mean, maybe times my expectations for how long everything would take double, if not triple, you know. So I had to come to terms with the fact that by choice, my primary responsibility is to educate my children and to get um, three children alive without being harmed by their mother into bed at night. <laughs> and so that has to take priority. And there are times that then everything else had to take a bit of a, a back seat. And so it took me two and a half years to write the book and to do everything for it. Would it have taken somebody else full time a lot less time? Of course. But that's not my reality. I had to just learn. And, and it's kind of that step forward thing. If you're taking the next step forward, if you're just doing the next little thing that needs to happen, it will all eventually, the pieces will all eventually fall um, together. And for me, I, I find having particular deadlines or having a timeline less helpful because um, I snatch time in between doing everything else. It's not, I don't have protected work time. Um, I'm a mom all the time, my children are around all the time. And so I snatch time in between. And it, it, you know, some days are more unexpected than others. So to just be a bit flexible with my expectations for how things were gonna go and what I could realistically achieve. And not because if I started to get stressed by the timelines I'd created, um, I got stressed, the children got stressed, and I eventually thought to myself, this is knitting for goodness sake. You know, it's not, you know, I'm not making the cure for cancer or whatever it is, it's, it's knitting. It, it is a great source of inspiration to me. It has been fantastic, but it has to be in its place within our lifestyle that we've chosen. Um, and I had to find people to work with that, uh, with me on the book that could um, work within my slightly more erratic time you know, scales and things like that. So, I mean, I found a fantastic layout person, um, Laura from Inkwell Designs in America, and she was just happy to when I plonked something in Dropbox, she would work with the next thing that I had done. And she would send me a question if it took... Um, a day or a week for me to answer it. She was okay with that. She didn't ever pressurize me into, okay, when's the next thing happening? And okay, what's the time frame? And when do we need to have this finished? She just fitted me in. She kind of went with that flow of what is a bit more chaotic. <laughs> and, and my inability to always give, you know, very strict timelines and stuff. Um, yeah, so I think those are the lessons I've learned is, is how my design process can work within the framework that I've got and to find the right people to work with that understand that um, and that don't get irritated by it sometimes taking me a bit longer to answer things or um, or that need very specific deadlines of things, you know, you get this photo in by that date and this approval by that date and, you know, I, I can't work on that, on those kind of more structured business lines, which I know you need to if you're working in, um, you know, with magazines and places like that, which is at the moment why I choose not to to design in that way. While the kids are still really small, so yeah. Lovely. So, sorry. Um, so, what has been that high point then, coming from that kind of this is what I've learned when it didn't go right? What has been the high point of your journey so far? This morning, when the box arrived at my door and I held my book for the first time. Because up until now, it's printed in America. So up until now, um, the people in America have received theirs and a box arrived with my sister in the UK. But up until this morning, I had pressed, you know, print and order all these books around the world without ever actually having seen the book. I mean, Laura, the... the um, lady that did the layout for me we sent obviously the proof copy to her in America because that would be much quicker and she flipped through it and she recorded it for me on a video so I mean I saw what it you know what it supposedly looked like but it's very different um seeing it on a video to actually holding your book in your hand um so I must admit that there was squealing and a very excited box ripping open <laughs> And, and Rachel, who is always the, the voice of reason, when I dyed my hair pink, Rachel told me in no uncertain terms that I looked ridiculous. 
<laughs> and so as I was ripping this box open, squealing like a child at Christmas, Rage is like, calm down, mom. It's only a book. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, no, the high point definitely was this morning actually holding two years worth of work in my hand and being able to see what I had accomplished. That was quite, that was quite special, actually. Oh, I'm smiling away here at the screen. <laughs> I can't see Sally at the moment because the internet, we thought we might not manage, so we're not actually looking at each other. I'm just listening and smiling at my screen like an idiot. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. And Rachel, bless her, she's, she's very wise for a 10-year-old. She's 10 now, right? She's 10 years. She's brilliant. So apart from Rachel's words of wisdom, which clearly are very apt, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, goodness. I mean, I suppose my parents have always... Um, I don't know if it's advice or if it's just the way they went about sort of bringing us up it was they never answered any of your questions directly they always taught you to figure it out and find it out for yourself and just the idea that you could find out anything and that you could do anything you liked just put your mind to it do the next step keep going and um that they would support us in absolutely anything we decided to do and and having that behind you is um is phenomenal you know to have that sense of there are people behind you that believe in whatever crazy scheme you want to do and um yeah so i think that 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 sense of keep going keep doing it and that you can do it was instilled very young from my parents um and to be logically and to be logical and think through things and think through the pros and cons and stuff and and in making decisions for the book and in making decisions for designing and what to do and various things, a logical um, approach is always good. And, and, and my favorite knitting advice, and this always comes, this is from, from our great friend, Claire Devine, um, is, you know, put it down, go away, leave it alone for a while and come back later and then have a look at it again. And a fresh set of eyes, obviously, you know, put it away, close it overnight, sleep on it. And so many times, whatever decision you're making or whatever piece of knitting you're struggling with or whatever it is, that time and distance gives you a new perspective. You can get too tunnel visioned into something and sometimes a step away is a really good idea. Yeah, that's a really good bit of advice, actually. I think we can, all, again, we can all identify with that when you just, sometimes you get a bit of tunnel vision and you get very kind of pig-headed about finishing something and doing it in a certain time frame and actually what you need to do is just put it down. <laughs> Lovely, so we'll move quickly on because I know you're going to have to leave us soon. Um, which one thing that you know now did you wish you had known when you picked up that first ball of yarn? Um... I don't know. I was pondering this question when you sent me the questions to look through. I, I, I suppose I just never, I always knew I was creative. But, you know, when, when picking a career, um, I wish I had trusted the instinct that you can do something with being creative. Or maybe I needed to go and be a nurse first. I don't know. Um, I wish I'd known it could be a career. I wish I'd known earlier that I, I come from a very creative family. My dad's a doctor, but he does uh, did a fine arts degree, and my sister was um, an artist and all the rest. And I couldn't draw or paint or any of those things. And I found my creativity, you know, through knitting. Um, and I suppose I, I just wished I trusted that instinct a bit more, whereas I just went to go and get a proper job. You know, I went to go and train to, to, to be, have a proper job. <laughs> I wish I'd studied something that had pertain more to knitting although I, I can't regret having studied what I did I, there are many times in my life where being a nurse and all the knowledge that I had has been I mean as, as a midwife for a while I don't regret um, working in palliative care with terminal patients either I don't regret any of it um, yeah I hope through knitting and as knitting now becomes more um, common and 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 uh, more children are learning to do it and stuff that people see the value in creativity and in teaching these skills and handwork and that it's so much more yes you can go buy a pair of socks in in pick and pay that's not the that's not the point um there is a value in being creative 
Um, and my dad was actually talking about it because he's a, a, a doctor, as I mentioned, but he's also in doing research and a lot of proposals. And they were talking about using hand skills and knitting specifically for um, helping groups of people with various illnesses. So instead of just having a support group, to have a support group combined with handcraft, because of the research into the, the amazing things that, that working with your hands can do within a group setting to break down the barriers, it helps people to talk. And we all know that from Ravelry, just being able to talk about knitting as connected people on, on levels of support in their lives that they couldn't imagine either, you know, just from knitting. You, you have this support and this network of people suddenly. Um, so I love seeing that. I love seeing the, the crafts and knitting and all the rest have, um, people are seeing their value far more than just um, twiddling some yarn and sticks around. You know, it, it actually has a mental and mental well-being value for, for lots of people. So that was a bit off the, off the topic there, wasn't it? That's all right. We saw, we're not prescriptive here. If we want to just randomly talk about other stuff, then we, then we do. Because <laughs> we can. Because <laughs> we're the boss, so it's good. Um, no, I think it is, and it was interesting what you said about um, I went to get a proper job, and that's something that's come up in other interviews before, where people have actually felt the need to do something creative, but have also felt pressured to do a proper job, or do a proper degree, or do something that society considers as being proper. Yeah. And then end up coming back to knitting anyway, because that's what they always wanted to do. But we're not brave enough. When you're 18 and you've got to make these life decisions, you're not brave enough, are you, to go, no, I don't want to be this, this and this. I want to be an artist or I want to be a knitter. Well, I guess when I was 18, you know, this hadn't, this whole internet explosion and the whole rivalry and all the rest, you know, it hadn't happened yet. So I, I doubt it would have even been possible at that point to do what I'm doing now. And as I said, I don't regret having done something else. Every experience gives you a another tool or another aspect to your personality that you use later on so yeah I definitely agree with that um so time for the random question then everyone knows that knitters love cake no stereotypes on this show if you were a cake which would you be and why now you're not going to believe me but the geek and I had an entire philosophical discussion last night over this question because I had to <laughs> I do believe you. <laughs> we had this entire discussion about what sort of cake. And we both immediately said carrot cake. But he, didn't, he, he thought he might insult me if he said that. I'm not sure why. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't sound sort of luxurious enough or sort of decadent enough or something. Um, and we ran through all these different cakes. But no, we settled back on carrot cake in the end. Um, one, I think because it's a little bit healthy or it pretends to be a little bit healthy. And, uh, you know, we try to be a bit sustainable. We grow our own vegetables. We try to, um, we try a little bit to be healthy, but we both really do like cake very much as well. Um, and Rachel is gluten-free and carrot cake is one of those that lends itself quite nicely to being able to be moved around and do different things with it. And it, it can, it can handle a bit of a change of ingredients and it's, it's come out really well gluten-free. So I think carrot cake has the change ability or, or the ability to move in different directions when it needs to. And that you can add a couple of interesting things to carrot cake as well. So I, th I think I'm a carrot cake. <laughs> oh, well, Sally, I'm very pleased to tell you, you've got the job. <laughs> no, I, honestly, I won't play that to anyone else. <laughs> It's always really strange to hear which kind of cakes people are. It is though, I'm like, yeah, I can totally see Sally as a carrot cake actually, possibly with pink frosting. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll press on because I'm getting distracted. I need more tea, clearly. Um, what is your favourite go-to resource for yarn craft or for the business side of things that you couldn't do without? Claire Divine. Claire Divine. That's everyone's favourite go-to resource, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I bounce ideas off Claire and uh, you know talk about challenges in design and general business stuff and uh, you know she printed her books before me so she was a great resource on what and where to print and and all sorts of layout ideas and stuff and moaning about being a parent and you no know, my, my my yeah I, I suppose that sounds funny but having a a really good friend that you can bounce ideas off and that you can talk to that understands what you're doing because they're doing a similar thing 
um, to me has been an amazing resource. And she's so nice. She is pretty lovely, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that's my that's my resource. Okay, well, I, I, I'm not sure if I can, we can start kind of pimping her out to other people for that, but it is, well, maybe not Claire Divine in person, because she's a, she'd probably be a little bit busy if everyone goes to her, but if you have someone that you can bounce ideas off that understands things, then I guess that would be close enough. I mean, you can get, you can get tools of the trade and yarn and all the rest all over the place, but to have, and somebody that's honest, you know, not somebody that's not going to tell you that every idea is a good one, or that he's going to say, oh, no, that design looks amazing. You know, that's not always helpful. You need the person that's, that's honest and that will say, what about this? Or look at it in a different way or take a step back. Um, yeah, I think everybody needs that, that person to bounce something off, that person to um, that you know will be honest with you about what you're doing. Brilliant. Well, where, what we'll do is we'll... Um, if you can give us any parting words of advice for anyone who's looking to get into this industry or indeed really any any other if they're thinking about kind of going into another sphere of business or trying to venture and they're a bit unsure about it. Have you got any parting words for anyone in that situation? And then once you've finished that, if you can tell us where we can find you and then we'll wrap up. Great. Um I'm not going to say anything unique here because I think almost every person you've interviewed ends with the same thing. Just do it. Just, just do it. Um, find your own way, your own, that what fits into your own life. You don't have to design in the same way as anybody else. You don't have to dye yarn at the same rate or the same, just if, if you can do one little thing at a time and that's what you do, you know, um, Carve a little market or carve a, a place that is congruent with yourself. That's the most important thing. Stay true to yourself. Um, get ideas from other people, support from other people, but you have to do it your way. Um, but just do it. Just go out there and do it. Because otherwise you're going to regret that you didn't. If you tried and it didn't go as well, then try a different way. But don't not do it. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Brilliant. So where can we find you then, Sally? Okay, I'm um, Pink Hair Girl on Ravelry and on um, Twitter. And somebody stole Pink Hair Girl on Instagram and they don't use it. If they were using it and they got there first, I would, with all good grace, give it to them. But they have Pink Hair Girl and they don't use it. So on the Instagram, I am Pink Hair Girl Knits. Um, my website is pinkhegel.com, which has the, all the information on the book. And my blog is pinkhegel.co.za. And there are all the links to the podcast from South Africa and sort of all the news of Cape Town and things like that on there. And I think that's about everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I have one more, I have one more question, if you have time. Sure. Will there be a Mzanzi tea? <laughs> when I was listening to you doing the book review and you were saying, um, you know, there's a lot of part of the country I haven't covered yet. You know, you have to draw a line under it somewhere. At some point, you have to just publish the book because you can make it, you know, 4,000 patterns, but eventually it's going to be so expensive, no one can buy it and you'll just never get it out there. So, yes, I've got, a, I've got loads of other ideas. Um, I'm taking a little break from, from doing ideas for the book just doing some individual patterns and things like that. Um, but yes, I hope so. I hope there will be, I hope there will be another one. Um, it's, it's so much work, but it is, it is worth it in the end. Um, so yeah, in no rush, I'm not telling it, uh, you know, give me another good few years and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Oh no, I, I know what you mean. I know Claire talks a lot about kind of, I'm never writing another book again. This is ridiculous. I'm, and then, you know, a few weeks later, you're back in, in the saddle again. So um, I've got my fingers crossed. <laughs> it's just taking the next step. And, and the, you know, when you live in a country like South Africa, it is so ridiculously beautiful here. Um, you can't help but be inspired by it. You know, I, I can't help but the idea is just happening and, and coming and wanting to show other people what it's like. So um, and I love stories, and, and that's kind of been what part of the book is about, is sharing the stories from South Africa. So, um, yeah, I hope so. 
I, I don't think the ideas are going to stop. So yeah, I'm probably going to have to have to do another one. Yeah, you'll have to put them somewhere. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm very conscious that you've been very kind with your time and, and been so candid with your answers. You are you are a big storyteller. I was very excited to get you on for an interview because I knew it would be really interesting and there would be a load of points to bring out there and there have been. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for letting me blather on so long. <laughs> no problem. And for those of you that don't know, Sally does have a podcast as well. I do, a video podcast, because I like to show things. I'm quite a visual person. Um, so I do have a video podcast. So I, I don't, again, put any pressure on myself and tell you it's going to be every week or every two weeks. Or I think you're also like this, Joe. You kind of have an idea of how often you're going to do it, but if life gets in the way, well, then it does. You know, you're not going to try and kill yourself. Um, yeah, so it, 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 the podcast happens when it happens, roughly every two weeks, but it happens when it happens. Is it going to happen now now? Is, is it coming now now? It's going to happen now now. If anybody wants to know what now now is about, they'll have to go and have, listen to the last podcast, hey? <laughs> yeah, I will, I'll put a link in the, in the show notes. I think I've mentioned now now before um, in, in one of the episodes, and I call it nowhere near now because that's when whatever it is is going to happen. It's got absolutely nothing. And various South Africans have interpretation of how long in the future now now may be. But uh, for those, yeah, I mean, you can go listen to the, the podcast, but it basically doesn't mean anything, anything vaguely near now. It means in the, in the future, um, an undisclosed point in the future. Yeah, and if a South African ever tells you that, that they're going to make a plan, just forget that thing ever happening, because <laughs> it will never happen. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I do miss South Africa. I miss it a lot. <laughs> Well, I'd better let you go, Sally, but thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. I really appreciate you giving us your opinion and sharing your experience with us. My pleasure. And best of luck with the book. Thank you. And uh, speak to you again soon. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Sally. I think you'll agree it was really interesting. It was good to chat to her. Sally's very kindly offered a copy, an electronic copy of her book as a giveaway for us. So if you would like to enter the competition to win a copy of that book, pop over to the Ravelry group and let me know what your uh, favourite pattern is from the book. You can find out the details of all the patterns, both on Ravelry and on pinkhair.girl.com. So again, to enter, just uh, let us know what your favourite pattern is. That's it from me till next week. Have a great week. Happy crafting. Speak to you all again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Shiny Bees podcast. Show notes to this episode can be found on the blog at www.shinybees.com. I'm Shiny Bees on Ravelry, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest and Facebook, so feel free to give me a shout. Or you can email me at shinybeesinfo at gmail.com. Music for this episode is provided courtesy of Music Alley and is by Adam and the Waltz Boys. It's I Need a Drink. Need a